Hi, this is Paul. With the release of these two videos, I received a lot of requests to do a little bit of commentary on them. I didn't really see the point of sort of doing the running commentary I often do on um, Jordan Peterson's work. It, it, the first one especially sort of really boiled down into this ongoing um, tribal desire to see Jordan Peterson become a Christian, depending on what you mean by that term. This game really got going in a public way on YouTube ever since he rose to prominence with C-16 and obviously became far better known than he had been before. He was a very popular um, he was a very popular professor at the University of Toronto, and then everything exploded when he sort of exploded about enforced um, speech. Now, making videos about this question can be a successful avenue in Christian media and social media. The YouTube algorithm constantly pulls out videos that um, this proves Jordan Peterson is a Christian. This proves this and that. And it's just sort of become a game. I, I wanted to shed a little bit of light on this as well as talking about the other thing that recently I received a lot of um, question about, which was um, Hans-Georg Mueller's response video to Jordan Peterson. So both of those are going to come in this video. All right. So often, especially on Twitter, you'll, you'll hear me talk about the different waves of Jordan Peterson. And right away when I saw these, I thought, well, maybe this is, this is sort of a third wave. For those of you who haven't heard this before, I pretty much map out his waves in this way, the Jordan Peterson waves. Uh, C-16 to June 2019, where both his illness and his wife's illness really took them off the stage for a considerable amount of time. And the first wave was, was characterized by major media interviews, a lot of major media attention. Uh, his Patreon grew, and then he closed it and began... Um, working with, oh, it's been, it hasn't been successful enough for it to be on the tip of my tongue. Um, I'm sure it'll, I'm sure it'll come up. Uh, his question and answer sessions were a big deal. And of course, the biblical series, which I think were some of his most important lectures, along with some of the classroom lectures that he had put online. The release for 12 Rules for Life to tremendous success. And then the book tour, which was sort of a book tour, but not really a book tour. That's all the first wave. Second wave really started in the January 2021 book release. And since then, we've had a whole variety of YouTube interviews. And it's been mostly um, YouTube interviews and sympathetic interviews on sympathetic channels. Uh, you know, the second wave, he was going. He thought he was going to have a sympathetic conversation with someone from the Times of London, and that blew up in his face. And so he's pretty much stayed away from mass media since then. I covered some of this in the Substack that I wrote this morning. For those of you who don't know what Substack is, it's sort of a real simple um, blogging site. Um, it's what part of what makes Substack much more um, pr better than WordPress or um, type type. I forget YouTube's, I forget uh, Google's um, type pad. No, that's not it. Uh, blogger. Um, it, they've, they've managed to make it an easy way for people to monetize. And so some uh, sort of IDW type individuals like and, um, Andrew Sullivan and Barry Weiss have stepped out of the mainstream media and are making a living now on Substack. Now, my Substack is not monetized at all. And so all the articles that I put on it are free and you sort of what I'm using Substack for now is um, sort of accumulating and aggregating Twitter threads. Um, I find Twitter is a way to rein in my ADHD and forcing me to have 200, um, to chop my thought into 280 character segments. It's not necessarily the most elegant writing style, but it sort of reigns in my um, I tend to I tend to lose myself, which is why I do PowerPoint and Twitter and some of these things to sort of um, get at my disability. Anyway, so this morning I wrote one. I'm not a prophet. I'm a clinical psychologist, sort of thinking about that Telegraph interview that he did and Hans Georg Mueller's um, response video that he did to Peterson. The Jordan Peterson social media management team is shaking things up. Um, in from the rather stable pattern of wave two, and I note this, that here in this little diagram. 
Google is no dummy in cultivating the attention of its creators. Unlike many other platforms, they sort of manipulate their creators with a huge amount of selective analytics. Looking at YouTube analytics can become sort of a drug, and I know that to be true. Um, it's embarrassing how many times a day I take a look at my analytics. That combined with my total disregard for growing my channel the way Rick would like me to. Contemporary business ideology watches rates of growth and values it. Um, my son was comparing yesterday the market valuation of Ford versus Tesla. Um, it's all future biased. My guess is that another 12 Rules for Life is not the barn burner the original was. How could 13 through 24 really compete with 1 through 12? So much of the wave number one status rocket was fueled by the conflict with Blue Church, both with and in mass Blue Church media. Despite its Decadent mass, uh, beside, beside, despite its decadence, mass media remains tremendously powerful and nothing grabs attention like a fight. An active YouTube channel with 4 million subs is not a thing to waste, so the team seems to be trying to pump some life into it. Shorts instead of just the long form, mostly the long form conversations. And now I do a lot of conversations on my channel, obviously, and a few things occur to me. Obviously, Long-form conversations with high-status, well-known individuals get a lot more views than conversations with randos. Um, not everybody will know all the different people that Jordan Peterson is talking to, but for the most part, he's not talking to randos. He's talking to some people who have written a book or have some standing often in the academy. These are people of interest to him in his world, and I totally understand that. But it's unless he's talking to Sam Harris or Bishop Barron or um, Elon Musk, you know, that's probably not really going to grow his channel. And then the question is, has have we already hit peak Jordan Peterson in terms of uh, international influence and power? You know, maybe, maybe not. Time will tell. I'm not disparaging this. It's part of the package that comes along with scale. Jordan B. Peterson, Inc. has the resources to continue to develop the ecosystem. The real question is focus. What is he going to focus on? The most telling interaction with Jordan Peterson that Hans-Georg Mueller doesn't get is the I'm not a prophet, I'm a clinical psychologist reality of Jordan Peterson. I've been going back and forth on Twitter with someone who says he's, he's angling to run for prime minister. And I said, well, prime minister really isn't the same as Donald Trump deciding he wants to be president of the United States. Prime minister is really the head of a party. And the guy responded back, well, the conservative party would love to have him. Would they or wouldn't they? Um, you know, Jordan Peterson is sort of a special kind of conservative. He's not hes not really a traditional conservative. He's an IDW conservative, which means he was exiled from Blue Church. And so now is, you know, the conservatives are excited about him because they have a hope of someone who maybe can bring sides together. And that, that's sort of the nature of the IDW. But I don't think he's going to do that because I think he's been telling us all along who and what exactly he is and what his worldview is. He's a clinical psychologist. He believes in the divine individual. And so his world-saving strategy is to save the world one individual at a time. In that sense, he's sort of like evangelicals um, versus, let's say, integralists, um, integralist Roman Catholics. Can Jordan Peterson's brand of clinical psychology colonize social media? Dozens of interviews on my channel suggest that there's potential there. I mean, I talked to how many people early on who basically received, had relief from depression by watching Jordan Peterson videos. That's a rather remarkable feat for a clinical psychologist. Um, I don't know that it's unique, but it's remarkable. And on the scale it was accomplished, I think it's significant. If, it, if I didn't think it was significant, I wouldn't have spent this much time talking about it. There are, as one would expect, real tensions between Jordan Peterson, Inc. and I'm not a prophet, I'm a clinical psychologist. What are the, mission, um, what are the missions of the man-turned-YouTube principality? That's kind of what he's become. Throughout this fascinating phenomenon, I've also thought of the comparison with Billy Graham were instructive because Billy Graham, in that sense, now, again, if you read Molly Worthen's book about the history of neo-evangelicalism uh, entitled The Apostles of Reason, neo-evangelicals and Jordan Peterson sort of share this modernist embrace of the divine individual. Uh, Billy Graham, quite a bit more successfully, you know, Again, I'll, I'll, I say this sometimes and people 
don't quite know what I mean. Billy Graham was dozens of times more successful than Jordan Peterson. But because he worked within a religious milieu and didn't really cross over bounds as obviously as Jordan Peterson does, people don't recognize the strength of that dynamic. But just go back and, and look at all that Billy Graham accomplished. And then Billy Graham founded the Billy Graham Evangelistic um, Organization. And that was, in many ways, a really successful way of bridging this gap between an individual and sort of Billy Graham, Inc. So you have Jordan Peterson and Jordan Peterson, Inc. And a lot of what we're seeing, I think, has to do with the tension between those things. Now on to these two videos. I withheld comment, a lot of comment, quite early on because, well, one came off and it was, it was a departure from what we've seen. But there are also some really strange elements to it. The green background, the little Pinocchio shot, and then the, the Stones music. And then a day later, the second one came in and still had the same green background. They're obviously set to be a pair. More Pinocchio stills, but now a, song, a song from Supertramp. And it's like, okay, what's going on? Is this, is this something new? Now... Is this, and some somebody on Twitter right away said, well, you know, this is a turn to more short content. Even though Jordan Peterson, in fact, does have a clips channel, the, you know, I have a little clips channel that I'm continuing to think about how to use. And right now I'm sort of using it for clips from other people's channel um, more than my own. You know, you know, I think Grim Grizz is doing some really excellent work. And so I've been putting some Grim Grizz clips on my channel and part of the reason I use my Vanderclips channel is to basically consolidate as a personal library for me of little individual clips that are helpful for me to find later. And I've used that quite a bit with the clip with Stephen Smith and Tara Isabel Burton and Ross Douthat on why Marianne Williamson's um didn't found a church because that's very interesting to me in terms of the platform question. So when I see these shorts coming out on Jordan Peterson's channel, okay, there's it's obvious that Jordan Peterson Inc. is trying to figure out strategy. I'm sure with Jordan Peterson, trying to figure out strategy. How should we use this channel? We've got a channel with over four million subs, and it's not growing in any of the, in anything like the speed that it grew probably from 2018 to 2021. It's, it's likely plateaued in terms of growth. And again, you watch YouTube algorithm, you want to increase the rate at which it grows. Now, most of us are not only nodes in networks, but we're nodes between networks. And when A Wing and a Prayer came out, somebody on my little CRC Voices network put it out, put it on the CRC Voices even before I could. And which got quite a bit of applause from the Jordan Peterson fans that are on the CRC network, um, the, the little CRC Voices network. And it's a very small network, and uh, not everyone there is a Jordan Peterson fan. But it, um, you know, it was quite. People looked at it, and thought, "Oh, look, he's 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 putting a prayer on the internet." I had a lot more suspicion about it, and thought, "There's some other things going on here." It's sort of a tor typical Jordan Peterson, rather stoic prayer. When Rebel Wisdom had a little U.S. tour and they interviewed me um, along the backdrop of a Noah's Ark, there's the one corner I could find in the church where we could do this interview. You know, I, I said Jordan is fairly stoic, and, and I continue to stand by that. Um, he's, he's, you know, the, the emphasis on the logos. I mean, that was a stoic theme as well as, you know, a theme that gets Christianized when uh, the Gospel of John begins its prologue with it. But, but a lot of his admonitions and his prayers are all about, all about self-reliance and strenuous individual meaningful effort. Those are the emphases. And my own brand of Christianity tends to emphasize um, the deliverance given to us by God and the agency of God more than the much more humanistic emphases that, that Jordan Peterson will put on it. But then when the second video dropped, a lot of enthusiasm very much departed, especially from some of my Canadian friends uh, who um, are 
you know, sympathetic to Jordan Peterson, but the um, outright attack on the prime minister, whether or not they're fans, fans of the prime minister, that sort of put them off. And I, those of you who follow me on Twitter also know that I've, I found Michaela's responses to these videos quite instructive, especially the second one, because one of the chief comments there is, you know, when my dad calls someone and, you know, not a real boy, it's about as bad of a put down as he, as he musters. And, and I, I totally believe that. And, and this gets into the question of fundamentally political or religious. And if you followed my channel, you know that I believe there's deep ties between the two. Um, and I have a variety of ways of, ex of expressing that. Politics is now, religion is always. And they run on very much the same, very similar frequencies within us, as does nationalism. So there's, there's a lot going on here. But again, none of this changed either my assumptions of where he's at with respect to Christianity and where and, and fundamentally what kind of player he is. Now, this was the, the Hans Georg Mueller response to Jordan Peterson, which I watched a couple of times and didn't really feel like doing a play-by-play, blow-by-blow commentary on it either. I didn't think it was um, by any means one of his more insightful videos. Uh, a lot of, you know, part of what Georg, in, in, in case you haven't noticed the disclaimer that he begins and ends every video with, Mueller is, in many ways, like Peterson, playing with the algorithm. They're exploring it, trying to figure out, what does this mean? And so Mueller, like Peterson, you know, needs these academics usually, they spend more time reading books than playing, building with computers and playing with cameras and such. And they are almost always, at least one degree or another, sort of dependent on others to get their videos out. And so, you know, obviously Mueller and some of his students are are working together on this project. And, and they've been fairly open in a lot of their videos about, well, to what degree can we game the algorithm? You know, if we do this, if PewDiePie does some commentary on Nietzsche, let's weigh in and and we can game the we can game the algorithm and and get up above zero. And that in fact they have done. And in many ways, I would have to say I wasn't smart enough to realize what I did. I did mine a little bit more accidentally, but after I did it, I began to realize more of how this works. I was a little less interested at that point in the internet and the the way that it's going to impact just about every other area of our society. But yeah, so a lot of people asked me for my commentary on his response to Jordan Peterson um, and his assessment of Peterson. And especially his, he was responding, Jordan was responding to Georg's assessment that in some ways Peterson and wokeism are two sides of the same coin. I wouldn't say it that way because that's far too dualistic. Um, wokeism and Peterson, along with a good many other things right now, are sort of part of some of the centers of gravity of our current social, cultural, political economy. Now, I think it's really important to continue to recognize a differentiation between Jordan Peterson, the man, and the phenomenon. The two are obviously causally connected. Um, what Jordan Peterson did in 2016 to 2021 was really, 2020, let's say June of 2020, the first wave, was really a remarkable, remarkable thing. And the second wave sur surely hasn't had the impact that the first has. Part of that certainly due to his health. You know, he fighting the blue church as a heretic within is something that's going to take a lot out of you. And it certainly did. Now, fortunately, and I'm really happy to see it over the last number of appearances, he seems to have gained a lot of strength back and is doing quite a bit better and is more and more fit to actually do some productive work. Now, whether he's going to jump back into the arena as heretic of Blue Church, I don't know if he wants to. I don't know if he should. Whether he's going to do that, well, he's probably not going to have the same kind of 
status rocket ride in any successive wave unless he does that. Because as I said before, Blue Church and the media machines around it, even though they're in decadence phase, even though they're in decline, even though they're, their end is coming, or at least a reassessment of them is coming, they're still an enormously powerful thing. And don't forget, YouTube is owned by Google. Google is not impartial to any of this. Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft. These are powerful corporations who are not sort of outside the spectrum of any of this culture war. And so even if we're seeing to a degree a run-up of other things in, in YouTube, as many of you know, YouTube can shut down whatever it is they want to shut down as soon as they want to shut it down. And so much of what's happening on these social media platforms, Twitter included, is just at the discretion of our new cyber overlords in one way or another. So, you know, Mueller's little disclaimer at the beginning and end of both videos we might look at that and sort of pass it by as, well, I don't understand that, so I'm not going to pay any attention to it. That's not incidental, what he's saying. And again, you know, watch watch the, Grib, Grib, watch the Grim Grizz channel. It's Right now, it's my favorite channel on YouTube. Every day I get up and I want to see if Grim has put out a new video. Now, favorite channel on YouTube changes quite a bit. You know, last weekend I went into a kind of a six-hour um kind of a six-hour splurge of this dude inserting his cat into famous movie mo moments. And then um, Nick Freerillian commented that suddenly he started getting these popping up on his, on his YouTube feed. And that makes perfect sense because the algorithm is watching me, watching you, watching me, watching you, back and forth and back and forth. And it's quite likely if you consume a lot of my videos, if I'm your favorite YouTube channel and I start watching different videos, the algorithm is going to put them over to you. That's the way this system works. So let's not be naive about the system or the interests that are governing this system. Anyway, so it, it's helpful to separate Jordan Peterson from the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. And my assessment is that Jordan Peterson's worldview and mission and personal faith worldview have remained pretty stable throughout. Jordan is a year older than myself. He's a year short of his 60th birthday. The cake is baked. He's unlike someone who's in their late teens or early 20s when there's going to be a lot of new coding being put into their system. Jordan Peterson's basic worldview is pretty set. Now, if he has a dramatic, if even if he has a dramatic Christian conversion where he decides he's going to sort of put off all of the downsides of what, let's say, bending the knee to Rome or joining the Christian Reformed Church in Toronto, um, or joining the Orthodox Church, you know, whatever the downsides that might be, and if he decides to, you know, not care about those downsides and submit himself to the discipline of a church, well, <laughs> the discipline of a of a church being what it is at this time and period, quite frankly, and that varies tremendously between from church to church. Probably the Orthodox being the most disciplined, and some Pentecostal groups, and the Roman Catholic Church. Not necessarily that disciplined if I believe all the the Roman Catholic trad chatter I see going on around me. So there's a lot going on. But I think basically, again, he's been pretty stable. I've watched a fair amount of his content from very early years, you know, his Harvard lectures, um, his years at University of Toronto, even though certainly his status rocket ride has changed him in many ways. I doubt that it's fundamentally changed him in terms of his foundationally religious perspective of, well, basically how to save the world. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, Dr. Jim, the cardiologist from Idaho, another rando, um, you know, there's brilliance out there in the randos that 
it's because of our salience hierarchies and our filters that we we can't harvest at all. So I would recommend if you're only watching large YouTube channels, you're really missing the blessing of YouTube, at least while we have it. And, you know, Dr. Jim made the comment to me, as many randos are, many of you, part of the reason I keep my rando slots open and really love doing randos conversations, and now they're sort of a I have to keep going back to certain randos and I have to sort of keep that whole train going, which actually takes a fair amount of work and effort, is there's a lot of wisdom in these conversations. And I get a tremendous amount of insight listening to you all. That's part of the reason I continue to read the comments. And I'm serious about reading comments. Um, new atheism arose with early tremors of the end of modernity, in some ways prompted by 9-11. So here you have religious fundamentalists that are causing a major geopolitical change. You have the war on terrorism, and again, I think the rest of history does a good job of did a good job of covering that and its retrospective. New atheism tries to preserve the winds of modernity against the traditional and available supernaturalist foes. And that pretty much is Dawkins and Harris and the others. That enlightenment framing of the conflict as natural versus supernatural continues to endure with, with many people fundamentally framing the conversation in that way. Part of why I think this is a late effort to try to keep modernity from slipping away is because the crisis of excluded subject is already well underway in postmodernity. And that's why, even though between 9-11 and, let's say, um, the second inaugural of Barack Obama, the focus of the new atheist was anti-theism, anti very quickly, a whole bunch of, especially the IDW types, switched focus from anti-theism, which no longer seemed to be the big threat, to anti-wokeism. So the IDW really arose to address the schism of the Blue Church. And Blue Church is sort of this um, accumulation of institutional media efforts that have sort of been drifting from um, sort of the Enlightenment humanism into early post-modernity and seeing wokeism and usually very light versions of wokeism as, as sort of their moral matrix through which to guide the world. And so you have a whole variety of individuals who are very much late modernists who are saying, no, we're not, we're not going into our woke future quietly. And and they have not been quiet at all, and they've used the tools of social media very, very effectively. Many of these individuals were, like Jordan Peterson, very much part of Blue Church. And, um, and it's only in this way that IDW has meant to, has become in some ways conservatives, because they're now more conservative than the, than the new woke church. Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro, however, are very much included in that list, but in some ways are outliers because neither of them are, are anti-theists. Um, they're two of the most powerful IDW members, and they're really not new atheists like the rest of them. Shapiro is, of course, an observant conservative Jew who has a major conservative political pundit organization in the Daily Wire who's recently moved his operation from Los Angeles to Nashville. Jordan Peterson is more complex, and a big part of that is, is sort of the Jungian influence, because Jung very early on, I think, was either, and I'm not, I'm not anywhere near enough an expert in Jung to be able to answer this question, either not willing to go fully into modernity or already getting beyond it in some ways. But, but Peterson remains fundamentally modernist in much of his orientation, especially in his, his habit. Um, he had a fundamentally pragmatic argument for justification for modernist Western civilization based on religion. I think in this way, you can really separate Jordan Peterson from, let's say, someone like myself, who is, I would say, I'm fundamentally religious in a modern context. He's fundamentally a modernist seeing 
the utility of religion for creating the modern world. I think that's the best way to sort of understand his perspective in this. He looks around doing a very pragmatic Darwinian assessment at the modern world and says, look at everything that it has produced for us. This, these adventures into wokeism threaten to take away our achievements. Let's not throw them away. Let's keep working the project and things will, con will continue to derive good fruit from this project. Now on the side, he's got some real questions and I think some very open and honest questions about, well, what exactly is religion? Could there be more there? And you almost always hear that whenever he's asked to answer questions about the resurrection. In those moments, his conversation with Jonathan Peugeot, you really see sort of his personal openness and especially due to his experience with visions, he seems to be, um, whether he's taken a psychedelic or not, he seems to be the kind of person that has visions. People who have visions pay attention to their dreams. Again, this, is, this very much fits into his Jungian side. People who have visions or pay attention to their dreams and pay attention to a lot of this usually are much more agnostic and open with respect to questions that are traditionally religious. And that's Jordan. Again, this has been true of him from before he was as famous as he is now. And I think that's just part of him. But that's quite different from someone who, let's say, is ardently, fundamentally religious and who expresses their religiosity in an enduring, firm commitment to communities and traditions of religious people. That's why, again, I look at him and I say, I'm not so sure he's evolved and changed and moved. I, when I look at him and I assess him, I think he's pretty much always where he's been. Now, religion is a central functional category accessible to modernist science for Jordan Peterson. Western civilization has a strong, better argument. Um, you can see that just by immigration patterns. People want to go from the less developed world to places like the United States and Western Europe, and they will risk life and limb to get to places like that. That's a pretty strong assessment of, in some ways, the dead reckoning superiority of these systems over others. Um, Western democracy beat uh, Nazism, it beat communism, and now, of course, China is rising, but I wouldn't count the West and the rest of the world out. I think a lot of people would rather make their peace with the avaricious, avaricious imperialism, but also sometimes generosity of the West, as with the Chinese, who get, <laughs> as, as opposed to the Chinese, we'll leave it there. Christianity is a social phenomena, has, is integral to this development, and Peterson recognizes it. Wokeism as sort of a new religion, and I don't think it's going to be, I think aspects of wokeism are going to continue to endure, but I don't see it as a terribly cohesive or consistently integrated religious system. And I'll probably deal with that in the next video that I'm going to make. You know, wokeism threatens the religious substructure of the West and must be stopped politically and socially. And I think that's very much where, where Jordan is at. And that's another one of his motivations for his videos. Now, Mueller likes to point to the role of the sovereign or sometimes divine. We're going to use divine much more in a functional term or a sociological term or a hierarchical term rather than an ontological term the sovereign individual in the worldview. And if you listen to Mueller's video, he just keeps hammering on this point. The role of the sovereign individual is the cornerstone of enlightenment political thought. Obviously so. See Jefferson's appropriation of Locke in the American Declaration of Independence. This became a watershed document that has fundamentally uh, reoriented even the old, church, old states of Europe that the nations that became nation states of Europe that had um, state churches, and some of them continue to. But for the most part, 
in after the Enlightenment, the American experiment won, and most nations have embraced aspects of liberalism like freedom of religion, um, the orientation of the individual, and all of this. Now, Mueller is, interestingly enough, I think in Macau, which will obviously be quite a bit closer to the Chinese sphere of influence and quite a bit uh, deeper into the, generally speaking, the more Asian perspective on communalism as opposed to individualism. Those cultural roots, roots run deep. And whereas Mueller likes to sort of in a popular way today cast dispersions on individualism, I've noticed that most people in the West who like to be skeptical about individualism, when push comes to shove, pretty much act like individuals. Their cakes are baked too. And whereas when I interact with, I see this often because in the Christian Reformed Church, about 10% of the Christian Reformed Church is of Korean descent. Um, one of the ways that the Koreans are far more communitarian than the Anglos or even the Dutch, the, the remnants of Dutch immigration, which is most of the Christian Reformed Church, you see that all the time, even though the Koreans are even more fractious in some ways than the descendants of the Dutch immigrants here in the United States and Canada. So, you know, th these are tremendously complex dynamics, but Mueller sort of wants to poke at the philosophical the, the passing philosophical, the sovereign individual philosophically is sort of passe. And, and he wants to sort of frame Peterson as sort of an old school, enlightenment, crusty modernist who just can't give up on his religion. And, well, I don't think you can, I don't think that cheap, I don't think you can really dismiss Peterson like that because Peterson, as has John Verveke, as has many who are deep into psychology, are very well aware of a lot of the philosophical and psychological and social critiques of individualism. And Peterson continues, continues to double down. And if you listen carefully to a lot of his work, not just his popular work, I mean, that's basically what Maps of Meaning is about, He's wrestling with those issues. In some ways, he's trying to save the sovereign individual from the assault that's here. And so, whereas from sort of a popular elite snobbishness, oh, he's someone who still believes in the sovereign individual. We all know that all of the really smart thinkers today don't believe in the sovereign individual. We're just accumulations of all of the past things that have gone before us. We're just, we're just what? What he's basically whispering is um, meaning crisis. What if you are just the robot in Westworld? I finished listening to Grizz's channel this morning and from a channel I've never seen before, a video a number of years old, the YouTube algorithm popped up for me a video about Westworld and basically Arnold, the character in Westworld, figuring out that he's a robot or at least the audience figuring out that he's a robot too. Sorry for the spoiler. So... You know, that's that sort of, well, all of us know that we're just products. I mean, that's, that's sort of Sam Harris land, even though I, I appreciated Mueller's addressing Sam Harris. I don't think there's a fully integrated realization in Mueller's critique of just how devastating this appropriating current materialism is for the meaning crisis. And again, this is this is what John Verveke and many others are deeply wrestling with. But I don't think you can just easily dismiss Peterson as Peterson doesn't understand all of the arguments. Um, Peterson doesn't understand all of the arguments against imagining we're a real boy. No, I think he does understand 
you know, certainly better than I am probably in many ways. I think he does understand a lot of these arguments from a scientific point of view, but that's a big part of his fight. That's the part of him that he won't deconstruct. He is going to assert you can become a real boy. You are a real boy. You're not merely an actor. That's key in terms of what he's been doing. So I, I don't think Mueller's critique of Peterson is actually true. Now, now Mueller, in his video on woke, likes to turn to Robert Bella's civil religion. And I think Mueller is correct that both wokeism and Jordan Peterson are dealing with what Robert Bella coined as civil religion um, when, he, when he observed it from the Kennedy administration in the late 1960s. I think I think Mueller should probably take continue to to work up Bella's road and maybe take a look at habits of the heart because with each, each of these steps we're sort of marking our marking our steps towards this meaning crisis but Mueller seems to be to have a modernist blinkers on as to not recognizing that all civil arrangements function religiously of course that's Durkheim and just about everything else in sociology. This is much more religion as a verb. Um, in the Enlightenment, let's see if that's the next slide. Yeah. We're getting into the definition of the word religion, and it's very hard to use this word and not sort of definition switch all along the way. And I think I think the care with which we have to use this word is to, when we're using this word, think about which definition we're using. So we use religion to point to such things as massive fundamental sets of um, assumptions, beliefs, institutions, symbols that are always difficult to define but really do in fact define us. In that sense, religion was discovered during the Enlightenment. And again, look at a lot of the work that Tom Holland has done on this, this video, which the sound is kind of crappy, but it's a terrific lecture. Tom Holland, did religion exist in the ancient world? That's a real question because we look at the ancient world and say it was completely religious. They didn't see it that way. And you can sort of dismiss that with a subtraction story, as Charles Taylor calls it. But why don't we look at, look at it ourselves? Tom Holland makes the point that India didn't know it was religious until the British Empire told them they were Hindu. Um, the ancient world didn't differentiate religion from what we do. This is, right now, the way it's used very much an Enlightenment motif. Mueller is fuzzy on religion like most atheist secular modernists, and um, he regularly definition flips on religion between the Enlightenment definition of religion as pertaining to the supernatural or dogma. Again, these are all Enlightenment categories, and the sociological definition of religion, post -Bur both post Durkheim and Bella, etc., religion as a universal functional category. Everything you know, human beings are fundamentally religious because we we use these symbols, these stories, these beliefs, these institutions, these traditions to navigate the world and understand each other. Recently, David Brooks had a very interesting article, When Dictators Find God. Everyone has a sociological, psychological, civil religion. Brooks, um, you know, modernity is receding, and as it recedes, the utility of all of this, in especially images in this image-based world, is going to be obvious and is going to be embraced. And Brooks not only talks about Putin and his embrace of Christianity, but the Chinese and their, their embrace of Confucius. The functional power of religion is being embraced even for people who are ontologically conflicted. And my conversation, part of the reason I sort of jumped my conversation with, with Greg Enriquez ahead of my convos posts, is that that became very clear in my conversation with Greg. And for me, it's a very interesting new development. People who, it's, it's a differentiation in language. Um, we lean into the symbols. We lean into the community. We lean into the narratives. We lean into the institution. But if asked, no, I don't believe that there's a God in the sky. And that's where I very much get into my God number one and God number two.
New Atheism signals the death of naive, imagined, religion-free society. That's basically what's happening. These things have these things take a long time to change, but it's clearly coming, and you can see that in all of the conversations in this little corner of the internet. In many ways, that's what certain aspects of this little corner are really focusing on. The Enlightenment anxiety about truth as physical correspondence remains, but our knowledge about how individuals and groups works push us to embrace the personal and the corporate mythologies. Mueller, to me, seems a bit behind the curve. Now, just even look at the way that we talk in this. A bit behind the curve. It's progressivism is just deeply built into so much of our language. Um... I think because of Christianity, because we're that much closer to the eschaton. If you don't have that fundamental narrative beneath, if you have more of a cyclical narrative, or if somehow you've managed to avoid um, linear Christian progressivism, well, maybe you don't see this as a problem, but that, that to me is sort of how Mueller looks. Yes, Jordan Peterson remains a modernist, classical liberal humanist. No, he's not naively so. Um, he's actually a bit ahead at the attempts to integrate the awareness of the sociological and the psychological religion and that this is unavoidable. And I think this has been the help that Peterson has given. And I think this is part of the reason that a lot of people sort of easily dismiss him because they say, oh, he's a classical liberal. He doesn't understand all of the science and cognitive science and everything that has come recently. And so he's just a vestige of the past. And it's like, no, nah, I don't think you can really say that of him if you look at what he's been doing. And if you look at the comments that he left on, on Mueller's critique of Peterson, I think that's basically what Peterson was saying. He was saying, please don't count me as being naive. He still remains. I mean, it's it's not unlike someone like myself who is, let's say, a classical theist, if we're going to use that term now who's a classical theist that believes in the physical resurrection, that believes in the miracles of Jesus, that believes all these things that many people would say, oh, well, you're just, you're just far behind the times, and then we can construct a whole group of bulverisms, a whole group of little such-so stories, why Paul Vanderclay doesn't want to give up on his embrace of the past, you know, he's raised in a Christian community, he's achieved status in it, yada, 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 yada. Okay, you can think of I mean you think of me what you will, that's the way this game goes, but I continue to try to wrestle with all of the things that have happened since and continue to try to mount a uh, justification for why I still believe in this deeply traditional Christian framing of the world. Now, you might think I'm outmoded or haven't kept up, and everything that's kept up since then has been important. I might just point to your perhaps naive embrace of Christian um, eschatology, but that's the way this conversation goes. Mueller seems stuck in Kant's Enlightenment dream, and always looking for a new Enlightenment is usually a tell about someone's connection to the old Enlightenment. Whenever you hear someone say, we need a new enlightenment, it often means they're sort of stuck with the philosophs. Um, he's not yet fully made the jump into embracing the social functional essential um, essentiality of religion. And I think this has been what Jordan Peterson and Tom Holland have. Now, I could be doing to Mueller what um, I'm saying Mueller is doing to Peterson. And if so, I'm sorry, I don't really intend to, and maybe I haven't listened to enough of his videos. Um, maybe I haven't appreciated his work thus far. Maybe I'm getting him wrong. I hope I'm not, but that at least is my read on it, because a number of you have asked me for my read. That's my read. Modernity is ending. The integration of the subject is well underway. Look at the title of his conversation with Peugeot. Uh, Peterson's not it is not that Peterson is unaware of these big movements, the perfect mode of being. And he's talking to a, a an orthodox icon carver. Peterson knows what he's talking about. I know a lot of people want to dismiss him because of the whole IDW thing. But in listening to Peterson, it doesn't mean he's perfect. But I, I do not think he's... He's ignorant in the ways that people want to dismiss him as ignorant. It's just not my reading 
of what he's been doing. And I, I yet I think Peugeot is is right that Peterson is divided, and these two land masses that are moving away from each other are. Peterson's got a leg on both, and he's getting stretched. And so Peugeot and others are like, jump, jump. He hasn't jumped. I think he's just kind of trying to hold on to these two land masses going away. And yeah, we're seeing the stress, but I don't think he's jumped. Maybe he's looking over at the other side more and more thinking about jumping, but nothing that I've everything that I've seen finds him still the guy that he's always been. An aspect of this is Peterson remains modern in his manners. Now, Fry, you know, said in the podcast, morality is about manners, and he has a point. Good manners for a modernist is to keep your science public and your religion, the Enlightenment definition, private. And so while Peterson has visions, Peterson has a fascination for, in an Enlightenment frame, it might be called the supernatural, Peterson again and 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 again. Did I say that enough to get the point across? Says, I'm speaking psychologically. I'm speaking as a scientist. He keeps saying that because this these are his manners. And even though he's triggering all sorts of people in his phenomena to ask about his religion, often when he's asked about it, if you'll watch him, you've, it seems like you've sort of asked him about his sex life or his personal finances or boxers versus briefs because that's private. He's a modernist and he's someone of the British realm. We Americans, you know, in our revolutionary ways, we're a little bit more free with some of this. Peterson isn't quite as uptight as, let's say, a Brit, but there he is. You know, it's it's funny. I've you know I've listened to a lot of so if if Grizz is my favorite YouTube channel right now, the rest is history has remained my favorite podcast for a number of months now. I, I listen to nearly every episode, and the deeper I listen, the more I'm the more I appreciate some of the differences between American culture and um, British culture. They're they're just more reticent about personal expression than we are here in America. So, yeah, Peterson, this this is who he is. And I see again and again on YouTube, people are like, oh, he's become a Christian. Oh, is, I think he's exactly who he has been. Now, has his wife made a journey? Apparently so. She's been quite open about it. Has his daughter made a journey? Apparently so. She's been quite open about it. Now, there's some differences between men and women being expressed here too. Peterson, as a dude... I think there's an aspect of him that is really private. And this whole area for him is really private. And so, you know, would he sneak out and uh, become a, a secret member of the Church of Rome? Perhaps, but I don't think so, partly because a pretty standard part of Christian confession is doing so publicly. And that goes all the way back to a number of things that Jesus says in the New Testament. So these questions will keep coming up. They can't help but come because intuitively, see, intuitively we see that the Enlightenment framework continues to dissolve around us. But again, these processes are measured in decades, often because our lives demand a level of narrative continuity. So again, the conversation that Peterson had with Tim Lott, which was a very early conversation, and the kinds of answers he says now, if you listen very carefully to him, he's pretty much saying the same thing. I don't see much evolution at all. If there is, he'll keep it private. That's my read. Jordan Peterson's modernist manners are baked in the cake. I don't think these two videos were a religious signal at all. I think these videos were much more Jordan Peterson, Inc., connected with Jordan Peterson, wanting to make a little bit more of a political statement. Do I think he's going to run for prime minister? Doubtful. Do I see signs he's joining the Church of Rome? I'll believe it when I see it. Jordan Peterson's public posture has remained quite stable. He's always said stuff 
about Justin Trudeau. And if you know anything about Canadian politics and about the kinds of tensions between English language Canadians and French Canadians, they are really hot. So my grandfather took a call to a Christian Reformed church in Owen Sound, Ontario in the 50s. My father remained to finish up his high school education in Iowa before heading to Grand Rapids to go to Calvin College. But my aunt, who passed away a couple of years ago, and my uncle, who is still alive, made the trip back up to Canada. My aunt and my grandmother hated Canada. Why did they hate Canada? They hated Canada because basically my aunt said, they didn't treat me nicely in school. (laughs) And my aunt would tell stories about how the other kids in school would treat her, that they had their stereotypical ideas about Americans and Canada is a different country than the United States. I know a lot of Americans just think it's our hat, but it's a different country and a different culture. And, you know, my grandmother didn't like being up there. And my grandfather felt it was the Lord's calling to be there and to help these Dutch Canadians who were coming over from Europe after the war in what today we would call all of this trauma from the Nazi occupation. And so my grandparents, very, as religious people, very selflessly worked hard to serve the church in Owen Sound, Ontario. In fact, that was the church my grandfather stayed the longest at because my grandfather had a heart for all the suffering of these Dutch immigrants and saw their need. In fact, in many ways, it almost jeopardized his ability to go back to the United States, where he was from, and to retire there because people began to wonder if my grandfather had English enough to really do okay in an American church again, which was absolutely preposterous because he was, of course, born in the United States and he was incredibly fluent in both Dutch and Frisian. (laughs) And then when some of the Canadian immigrants or the immigrants to Canada started playing games between the Dutch and the Frisian in the church in Owen Sound, you know, there were some there were some Frisians in the congregation that were saying not nice things about my grandfather, sort of in front of him in Frisian, imagining he wouldn't understand what they were saying in Frisian. He stepped into the conversation in perfect Frisian. A lot of games were played like that in a lot of churches. And um, my grandmother and my aunt used to tell pretty amazing stories about the goings-on of, of many of these places. So that being said, Jordan Peterson's Canadian. And I know that for a lot of Americans is also a filter that we don't see very well, but it's there. So his public posture has remained quite stable. Always signals about private and personal struggle. He's tortured. And I think Peugeot, a fellow Canadian, but a French Canadian who's also a friend of his, who Jordan clearly trusts and likes, you know, they had a rather remarkable, I felt, intimate conversation online. It was a remarkable conversation. And yes, a whole bunch of us are really antsy about the Bishop Barron, John Verveke, Jonathan Peugeot conversation being released. I'm very much anticipating and looking forward to that conversation. These two videos, I think, were fundamentally political. Um, Don't forget Jordan Peterson's Darwinian measuring stick for truth, okay? And are they civil religious? Yes. And on that, Mueller has a point. Jordan Peterson is a pragmatic Darwin, Darwinian modernist scientist. And this is a point that Adam Friend keeps making to me. Part of Jordan Peterson's, part of Jordan Peterson's fame is because he doesn't cross the line publicly. And Adam is right. Jordan won't. And in fact, rationality rules and destiny both get this right. He makes a staircase just up to the line And everybody else takes that staircase and goes over the line. Adam doesn't. Rationality rules doesn't go far enough up the staircase. But Adam is right. Jordan stays to that line. And so then Adam's admonition to me is, if you only stay by this line, and it's like, Adam, I'm a Christian minister. (laughs) I live on the other side of the line. I travel the ups other stairs to walk down it. So I go back over all the time. And so, and you say, but you'll be more popular if you only stay on this side of the line. Yeah, but 
I'm on the other side of the line. My cake is baked too, and I've been formed to perform before an audience of one. And by that, I don't mean my audience or my wife, but my God. That's a Christian. So I may do so badly, but that's the point. That's why the line is there. And so Adam is right about part of Jordan's popularity is he stays on that side of the line. And Jordan knows this. But Adam telling me I could, you know, be rich and famous by sticking to that side of the line, that's not going to work for me. My cake is baked too. So he's, um, outcomes are how truths are assessed in Jordan Peterson's Darwinian modernist framework. He's evolved beyond the Enlightenment religion definition. And again, Jung has a big part of that unlike Mueller, to see that sociology and psychology mythos is a key function in the foundation of, po of public politics and, pri and private flourishing. In that sense, Mueller perhaps has bought into the, the modernist lie that, oh, the Enlightenment is, is you know, our, our ethics, this, Mueller can't be bought into that because he knows Kant too well. But, and you know, he should know the failure of modernity's attempt to ground values that, that has been simply a complete failure. And so, and that's sort of where Adam, um, I, I think Adam is, is, is kind of on Jordan Peterson's side here, but, um, yeah, Mueller, I don't, I don't think Mueller's critique of Peterson is, is well-founded back to the telegraph thing. And this is what I wrote the the substack about are you a prophet basically his answer is almost always i'm not a prophet i'm a clinical psychologist that's what i am i'm here to rescue individuals and i'm going to use social media and just about any other thing to do so to the degree that i involve myself in institutions and structures those are to serve for him the governing in a sense that's his religion the governing attempt to help individuals and again, there's some commonality between, let's say, him and Billy Graham in that, but it's fundamentally classical liberal modernist who sees the sovereign individual as the key. He helps people perform better as individuals. He's instrument and he sees institutions as instrumental in individual flourishing of society. And even though a lot of people think we're sort of beyond that, I don't think we are. I think that's also baked into wokeism. And in that sense, Mueller is right. There's, there's deep ties between Peterson and wokeism, but it's much more like opposites. Like when I made the comment that Nadia Boltz Weber and, and Mark Driscoll are really like opposites of the same emergent movement. Now, for those of you who don't know insider baseball and the development of the American church won't have an appreciation for what I'm saying, but there's a sort of like opposite dynamic with respect to Peterson and wokeism as there is between the whole IDW because what defines the IDW is anti-woke because they very clearly see wokeism as a threat to a lot of the classical liberal modernism individually based that American and Western systems are really premised upon. And he keeps telling us exactly who he is. Do you want to see your God religion? Well, what won't you deconstruct? And I think Mueller isn't sufficiently cognizant of the meaning crisis because that's the thing that he endangers by continuing to go down that realm. And here again, I would say that Verveke is beyond him and that Verveke understands this is where that road goes. And so Verveke and many others in this little corner of the internet are saying, what we need is a religion that's not a religion. And he wants to take away some of the problem areas of religion and construct something new. And I'm over on the Christian side of things saying, I'm very skeptical about your project. Um, I would rather stick with um, received inherited Christianity and continue to try to address some of the areas that it's underperforming or get some things wrong, et cetera, et cetera. 
Now, he, I think he's flirting with some of this in his pro Felicity work. And when you get into identity and frames and in the video that I made sort of doing a comment on on Grim Grizz's comment on Hyun Chu's conversation with me, I got into some of that. And again, I wanted to do a little bit more work on his pro Felicity. And I very much read the comments that you're saying, what is this pro Felicity? It just means basically profiles or personas. And that's true. I think what academics usually do, and pastors do it too, is we reach for new words when we find our old words aren't encompassing everything that we need to encompass. And again, look at Mueller's, look at Mueller's, his, his intro and outros with his warnings, because Mueller understands that we're playing with more things now than we did before this age of rapid, um, rapid profilicity, let's say. The meaning crisis is that you, is that, is that terrible, should be terrible, not terribly, that terrible moment when you real when you might realize you're not a real boy. And and you see this with the, the strings of evolutionary psychology. So my criteria for putting up the flag when Jordan Peterson crosses the line will be whether or not he joins a Christian church. And I don't mean making up a, excuse me, making up a church in order to help a friend get married. I don't mean that. I mean joining a church. Because beyond that, I think everything else he says and everything else he does is intelligible in the frame that he has mapped out. He might have been, I say, and I say baptized, and the thing is, United Church has infant baptism, so I don't know whether or not he was baptized as an infant. And again, because of his modernist manners, to ask him would sort of be like asking boxers or briefs. Now, as a Christian minister, I don't see baptism as a private thing. I see baptism as a public thing. And this is the resistance that the Christian church has ever since modernity continued to hold and saying, no, this is public. And, and that might be one of the lines that separates churches that have become completely modern from those who continue to have a fair amount of traditional pre-modern DNA or code running through their systems. What he seems more to be doing, quite frankly, is what we're watching others do like John Verveke and um, and Greg Enriquez. He's sort of, via YouTube, making a religion that's not a religion. And in that way, is he kind of a prophet? Can we understand why people think he's a prophet? Can we understand why people think it's prayer? Is he an actor in a civil religion? Yes. So in that way, Mueller is correct. I don't think Mueller is sufficiently aware that he too is an actor in a civil religion um, because he, in that moment, definition switches religion over to the Enlightenment definition and not the Durkheimian definition. And so that's sort of where we're at in terms of a religion that's not a religion. And, you know, I really enjoyed my conversation with Greg that I had. And yeah, there was sort of a crying game moment in there when he told me about the religion that he is putting together. And in that way, he's, I, I, I haven't seen, I mean, when, when Greg goes fully into symbolism, well, now, you're, now you've got both feet in. And I don't mean symbols that are ambiguous, that are ambiguous as to with the enlightened defin enlightenment definition of religion or no religion, I mean symbols that are unambiguously, according to the enlightenment definition, religious. And if you're relating to those symbols religiously, I think those are some of the lines of demarcation. And, you know, I, I haven't heard John Verveke 
may cross some of those lines. And in that sense, perhaps, you know, John Verveke continues to be more of a Protestant in that it's more about practices, it's more about ideas. We haven't seen John Verveke set up a statue for his religion that's not a religion. Now, as much as I I don't know how I would respond if he had done so, because Protestants are really reactive to statuary, in case you haven't noticed. So watching the development of these postmodern religions is really key. And so, you know, again, these conversations with with John and with Greg, and, and Greg's very open about this, which I think I frankly respect because there's a real cost to what he's doing in terms of his career and his reputation. And I respect people who stick to their convictions and do so at considerable cost. And that's part of the reason I do respect Greg and John and Jordan, because they are doing so, and it costs them something. And what that cost reveals is a commitment to something, a commitment to being something other than the thing that floats around with the current, okay? And actually, um, let me handle this first. You know, in this way, we're sort of, we're continuing to see the rise of postmodern religions, and wokeism is one, but we're going to see probably a, a dramatic religious landscape, um, probably an active one, where we're going to see, again, Tara Isabel Burton's been writing about this, Ross Douthat's written about it, we're going to see a lot of them rise, and, and modernity is going to sort of be a, a drag or a weight on them to get them, to keep them from being too dramatic, because the, the cultural cost will be there, but, you know, we've already seen this in the New Age realm, and this is what we're going to see. Now we see a lot of people sort of cooking it up in their own backyard, kind of having their own religious still in the backyard. But we're going to see a lot of smarter people like John Verveke and Greg Enriquez and Jordan Peterson sort of working on this from the scientific end. And I think we're going to see a number of people basically go and move into religions and more established religions, probably all across the spectrum. But when they move into these religions, they will continue to change them because, you know, religious landscapes, landscapes continue to change almost always in conversation with far broader social, cultural, economic, technological changes that happen in society. So that's it. So that's my take both on, that's my response both to um, Mueller's response to Jordan Peterson and to Jordan Peterson's latest two little videos. Let me know what you think.